second session, The Creative Code. A place to fall in love. Shimon Peres once described Tel Aviv as a place to fall in love. It allows us, he said, to be carefree people, yet demands serious creativity for us. That incredible combination of love for freedom and fun on the one hand, and an endless drive for success and creation on the other, is what makes us the startup city. As Richard Florida coined the term the creative class, he claimed that in order to attract them to the city, one needs to stick to three T's. I think we know them off by heart. Tolerance, technology, and talent. And if we rephrase it, talent, technology, and tolerance. If you build a city in which talent can prosper, in which technology can develop, and in which tolerance is the key value that ties everyone together, the creative class will consider it their home, and they will bring with them their innovation and creativity. In that spirit, we choose today to celebrate creativity to showcases a unique group of individuals who are redefining an old idea in a new way. The Tel Avivians, they work in and represent some of the world's great cities, but it's that creative drive that makes them all Tel Avivians. I would like to moderate our creative code. I would like to invite a true Tel Avivian by geography and by spirit, Dr. Yossi Vardi. They don't call him a serial entrepreneur for nothing. For over 40 years, he has funded and helped build over 60 high-tech companies in a variety of fields. Yossi is the co-chairman of DLD, together, of course, with Steffi. And this week, Tel Aviv is celebrating the DLD festival on which City Summit is so proud to be a part of and that's an opportunity for me to say thank you again. I know the passion Yossi has for creativity in cities, and I'm grateful that he's sharing his thoughts with us here in the Creative Code. We prepared for you something really special, so stay tuned for the next hour. Yossi, please. Thank you very much, uh, Hila. Thank you, all the guests. Thank you, Izzy Borovic. I am sure you were uh, introduced. Izzy and I fought for about uh, seven or ten years for a certain uh, traffic uh, junction in Tel Aviv. And uh, nice to see you. Uh, as <coughs> Ila said, I was born in Tel Aviv 70 years and one week, no, one month ago. And, uh, pardon? The time is running very much, you know, it's like toilet papers. In the beginning it goes slow, and then towards the end it <laughs> going very quickly. <laughs> and uh, it was amazing to see the transformation of this city. I still, honest to God, remember where we carried sand uh, on, uh, on camels to the building. And look what's going on here, the, the transformation of this city is uh, went through last uh, 10 years is really uh, amazing. We have very short time, you didn't come here to hear me, you came to hear our terrific roster of uh, speakers and I prepared two, two slides to give you the essence in a very short, in, in, instead of very big talk, the essence of the change that Tel Aviv went through and why it became a creative city. Can you please show my first slide? This is the building of the municipality of Tel Aviv. It was created maybe 30 years ago, and when it was created, it was really a very outstanding, clean, neat building. If you look at the top left, at the, at the top right, three windows, this is the office of the mayor of Tel Aviv, and this is how it looked like for about 30 less two years ago. And two years ago, the mayor and the staff added something into the building in order to project the new spirit of Tel Aviv. Can you please move to the second slide? 
This is a duck which was created by an amazing artist by the name of Dudu Geva. And uh, it was uh, put on the top of the municipality two years ago. And I can tell you one thing, every person who drove that morning in Ibn Gvirol Street and saw the duck got a song in his heart. So here you have a very, very effective, simple but effective symbol of how you change the character of uh, the city. I think, Ila, that you should make the duck the official uh, the official emblem of the city, or at least the official emblem of the creativity of the city. Anybody agree with it? Yeah. My son will be very proud of me. Okay, <laughs> he's an admirer of Dudu Geva. I would like uh, to start by inviting Burkhard Kaiker from Berlin. Burkhard is a journalist, he's now a past journalist, now he's the head of the visit Berlin, and as all of you know, Berlin is one of the cities which reinvented and still reinventing itself for Burkhardt, please. But try to limit your time because I already consumed seven minutes and we have about 20 minutes for all the five of you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hello all together, of course, big pleasure to be here, to come down from the cold north to, uh, to Tel Aviv, but Maybe at the end of some little stories, I'll tell you, you see that there are a lot of symbol. Your end is now. Huh? <laughs> the end is now for seven minutes. Okay, uh, you will you will see a lot of similarities. Well, Berlin, a city that reinvented itself, and there comes a very complicated undertitle. Forget about it. Let's start. And uh, uh, no, that's me. Okay, yeah. You know what my secretary said when I, when I put up this slide? How can you do this? How can you use such an opportunity to start with a gray slide showing Checkpoint Charlie in the 60s where East and West were, were confronting each other? I said, because this is the truth. This was a predominant picture of Berlin for more than 40, 50 years. A city completely destroyed in the Second World War. Then the rubble divided in two parts, a communistic part and a, and a capitalistic island in West Berlin. Um, and uh, yeah, this was a picture of great people, gray environment, weapons, tanks, Cold War. And then the wall came down. Next picture should be people dancing on the wall. You all know these pictures. Uh, I didn't do that. I want to show what uh, is remaining from the Berlin Wall. This. Uh, 254 kilometers of cobblestone we laid where the wall was all around uh, and through Berlin from 1961 to 89. And no presentation without numbers. When the wall came down, when we, myself also, when we all were dancing on the wall in that night on the 9th of November 89, we thought, okay, that's, that's uh, a, a historic moment and Berlin will be back. But Berlin wasn't back. It took us 10 to 15 years to recover from that historic situation. And um, you will see this when I show you our tourist numbers. And this is the last, last series of numbers, I, I promise. Um, you see in, uh, yeah, and in, uh, in, in, 80, in 89, uh, it was flat for many years until 2000, and then it started going up. And uh, for us, very, very much amazing, uh, we overtook Rome last year. We're always joking, Rome had 2,000 years in advance uh, to, to get used to, <laughs> to tourists. Um, and uh, it took us 20 years to overtake them. Uh, we are always discussing with them. Uh, this year, at the end, uh, we'll have 25 million overnights. This makes Berlin number three in Europe. Number one, of course, London, way, way above us. Then it's Paris with uh, 35 million overnights. And then it's already Berlin and growing with about 10% right now uh, per year with tourists. People seem to like uh, what the Berliners have made out of the city in the last 20 years. Brandenburg Gate. This, is, this photo is taken where the wall was. The photographer is standing on the line. This is the Brandenburg Gate, one of the three iconic buildings in the world. But this is Berlin too. This is uh, uh, one of these uh, Prenzlauer Berg um, uh, courtyards. And we always say, Berlin, show your wounds. Keep, 
yeah, um, show you historic wounds. Don't plaster the last bullet hole because Berlin is a focal city of history, both for the very bad and for the very good. Because many people now think the Berliners have ended the Cold War. Actually, it was the Polish and the uh, were the Polish and the Hungarians. But the people, because of these pictures of the night when everybody was dancing on the wall, think this, the Berliners ended the Cold War. So you can find this. Berlin is authentic, but on the other, on the other side, Berlin is also uh, um, uh, a lighthouse for culture. We have seven symphony orchestras. We have the only city in the world with three opera houses. Absolutely expensive, as you can imagine. Uh, but uh, we pay for it. And uh, this is a very nice, very nice girl from, from Egypt, uh, Nofrititi. Uh, on the museum island, you can visit her very easily. But beside the, the mixture, the mixture is very is uh, what makes a city uh, going. Thirty seconds, okay. Uh, the, the mix, the mixture is. Uh, huh? What? You, you, Okay, this is what. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, mixture, high culture, subculture in, in Berlin. Um, Berlin is the, the hotspot for contemporary art. More than 10,000 artists are working in Berlin. Why? Because Berlin is still value for money. In, uh, in Berlin, you can live on very low cost still, and you can rent out an atelier for three. Try to do so in Paris uh, uh, or oh, in Tel Aviv. Yeah, uh, the gallery district, um, more than 600 galleries, because all this is attracting. And to come to the title, is attracting creative people. People want to come. First of all, they have to live. They have to. They, they have to be able to make their living. It has to be not too expensive. Uh, then you have to have a critical mass of other people creating things, painting, doing IT and so on. Uh, and uh, when you get this mixture right, uh, you will be successful. For instance, Tempelhof Airfield, uh, an airfield in the middle of the city. We closed it down some years ago. And uh, that's how it's used now. Uh, the people, the families go there. I, I go there with my kids in the evening, do skiting. You can, uh, uh, you can have uh, a picnic on runway 25 left. Uh, two weeks two weeks ago, I was there, and uh, I heard I heard some piano uh, piano player. I think what is this? And somebody brought his piano on on two five left, and uh, and people were gathering. It was a nice jazz concert. So this is uh, a, <laughs> a magic moment. Yeah, and then please finish. And then um, people try to make a oops, try to make a a master plan, and we skipped it because. My advice is no master plans. They will spoil everything. Just leave it to the people. Leave it to the creative people. They have the master plan. There was no creative mastermind for Berlin in the last 20 years. Uh, it just came out of the people who were coming to Berlin, who wanted to live in Berlin. And so I can only say, come to Berlin. It's all about sense, meaning, perspective. And we say Berlin, a mixture of Adrenaline, and at the same time, chill out. <laughs> Come over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last month, I was in the Temple of uh, Airfield for an amazing event by the name of uh, Campus Party. Actually, Ben uh, Rooney and I were there, and it was really quite amazing. It's, uh, you have to see it, and uh, as you say, the nice thing, it was open to the creativity of the people. I think one of the main, the main epiphanies of uh, cities is that the grassroots, the bottom-up movement is not less important than the top-down, and uh, if the top-down is reinforcing the bottom-up, <coughs> you really get amazing things. I would like to invite <coughs> Robin Shapiro. Please join us. Robin is running something which is called Low Line, but according to the description, I think you should call it the Underline, no? Or uh, 
And the one question, Robin, this is part of the municipality, it's private initiative. Private initiative. So you go and do it on your own. And what the... Okay. Yeah, we need two microphones, otherwise I cannot disturb them. <laughs> you can be a loud talker. So maybe you tell us about the low line and maybe two words about other interesting things in, uh, in New York, if well, you can. Like. I'm not from Visit New York, but I, I can talk to you about the low line and if there's time, I'll talk to you about some other there things will be no time, go ahead. <laughs> So uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm happy to be here speaking to you all today. As Yoshi said, my name is Robin Shapiro, and I'm the head of operations for a project in New York called the Low Line. So the Low Line is an effort to build the world's first underground park. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is a story behind this crazy idea, where we are in the process, and how we're very seriously planning on making this a reality. So first off, fun question, anyone know who this guy is? <laughs> this is Shigeru Miyamoto, and he is the designer of one of the world's most popular video games ever, Super Mario Brothers. It was a game which I addictively played as a kid, and I'm not the typical video game type of person. So why is this game so popular? Like most video games, it plays off a sense of adventure and curiosity. If you jump up and hit that question mark, a gold coin emerges. If you jump a bit higher into the clouds, you might find a special reward. And if you have the guts and the curiosity to go down that green pipe, then a whole new world emerges. Some of the rules are different, some of the species look different, and it's really this whole new land of opportunity and possibility. Similarly, New York City is a bit of a video game itself. It's quite crazy and distracting. There's many things to see at street level. And in fact, it's at street level that most New Yorkers think of as their city, and the underground is really this dark, nasty, smelly place, a place where you'd really only go to use the subway, but it's not a place of any value. Interesting to note, though, is beneath the streets of New York lies 13 acres, or 52 square meters, I did my conversions, of unused space. So the project's co-founders, Dan Barish and James Ramsey, became aware of one very important, special, and unique place, and that is this. So this is the former Williamsburg trolley terminal. It was used in the streetcar era of New York City in the early 1900s. Uh, and for those of you familiar with the area, it was in the Lower East Side, and it was used to transport people to Brooklyn over the Williamsburg Bridge. It's over an acre, 4,000 square meters in size. And it hasn't been in operation since 1948, a very important year for this uh, country as well. But it's really incredible, both due to its size and the fact that it hasn't been used in over 60 years. So this is what the site looks like today, and you can really start to get a sense of its scale. It's quite uh, cavernous and big. The ceilings are over, 11, or over 12 feet or 3 and a half meters tall. And you can start to see some of the old railways and cobblestones and corrugated ceilings, and hopefully you can start to see some of the potential of the space. This is another view. Uh, you can see the, this is a former control tower on the left, and we immediately got to thinking, wouldn't it be fun if this could be a tree house for kids? On the, on the right, this is uh, the old um, cobblestones. These are actually Belgian blocks, which were literally brought over from Belgium at the turn of the century. And this is where the site is actually located. This is an aerial view. The green area is the proposed low-line site superimposed over a Google map. That yellow area is the Williamsburg Bridge, which I mentioned. And something that's important to note, something that's important to us as residents and those who work in this area, is that it has a major lack of green space. The area consists <laughs> just largely of a series of parking lots and dense, crowded housing. This is something that's not new to the area of the Lower East Side, and it's something that we began to investigate further as we became more and more excited about this site that we found. So this is just a really basic chart which shows the downtown area of Manhattan that we're talking about and its lack of green space it, within the city, which in itself is a city which lacks green space as compared to other cities of comparable density. So this is a very clear issue in terms of the amount of people living per unit of green space. 
But as I said, this is something that's not new to the area. It's something that has plagued the Lower East Side for quite some time. And in the area, you could always find a very bustling streetscape. And for the many generations of immigrants for which the Lower East Side is known for, these were the conditions they lived in. This is where my grandfather lived when he immigrated from Russia. He lived in crowded tenements like other Jewish immigrants. And he started working at the age of 10 with his push cart on the street. And he sold hair barrettes, these special hair barrettes that were made of uh, this type of plastic. My mom, my <laughs> everything, everything was sold there. And it was in the streets that was really the only public place. And I guess at the time that wasn't such a huge issue, but over the course of the century, cars really took over. So flash forward to today, and we see a very, very different city. This is a view of the Williamsburg Bridge looking into the area of Manhattan where we want to build the underground site. And we see a very different city. But in fact, a lot of the same conditions still exist. It's very crowded and dense. And one of the things we see here is the real takeover of cars. What the municipality says about your initiative? Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna get to that. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna get to that. Uh, so it's an issue, you know? So we see a very clear issue here, and the question is, what do you do? How do you think about transforming this neighborhood in need? How do you think about this site that we found and think about it becoming something else? And we think the solution is with technology. So this is a type of solar technology that one of the project's co-founders, James Ramsey of Rad Studios developed. And what you see here is basically at street level, a type of inverted umbrella that will collect sunlight. It will reflect it to a single focal point and through a series of fiber optics and mirrors, redistribute it beneath ground at an intensity that will allow for photosynthesis. So plants and trees can be growing beneath our city's streets. This is something that we've tested both in prototype phase as well as we recently put on an exhibit for last month to showcase how it would function. So you take this site and this concept of solar technology, which I briefly brought you through, and we started playing around with what could become. So this was led by James and his design firm, and they started to envision what a future subterranean park with the introduction of natural sunlight and green plants and trees could look like. And they came up with this. There's our series of images that were put out just about a year ago and they got people in New York and around the world, which I'm thankful to be here today because of, very excited. What you see is these solar distributors and they're bringing in this really wonderful quality of light. The light's almost raining down. And we see these green elements and this exquisitely designed space. Here's another view which lets you think about how the existing railways could be incorporated into a type of walkway to create this really nice experience. So that's great. And, and really, over the past year, we've been getting these images out there. There's been tons of press. People are excited. They say, oh my god, that's awesome. But how do you actually do this? How do you build the world's first underground park? So one of the first things we did, and I'll be speaking about this a little bit later on, this, uh, on one of the panels, is we created a Kickstarter project. And we were really blown away by the success in a relatively short... Can you say very quickly, because we are really running out of time, what is Kickstarter project? Yeah, so Kickstarter, for those of you who don't know, is a very popular crowdfunding platform in the US. Can you tell them what is crowdfunding platform? <laughs> <laughs> who so knows what is crowdfunding platform? Raise your hand. Yeah, these are sophisticated and, guys. And Don't I think, tell them, anybody who doesn't know, ask his neighbor. Go I ahead. think we'll... <laughs> so I think we'll go into that a little bit more in one of the breakout panels later, but if you just give me a, a few more minutes, I'll, I'll start oh, no, to... We don't, we don't have time, we are sorry. <laughs> um, so Kickstarter was a, a very successful platform for us. We were able to raise over $150,000 from over 3,000 individual backers in a relatively short period of time. What did you promise in return to the backers? You get, uh, there's many different reward levels of things you can get, a t-shirt, uh, there's buttons, there's pins, and if you give a, the, the highest amount, you get cooked a dinner by uh, the co-founders and myself. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, you know, you gotta do what you can. 
Speaking about dinner, can I go into a personal question? Um, <laughs> are you, right, these are my witnesses. <laughs> are you related uh, anyhow to Fine and Shapiro, this exquisite chopped liver joint on 72nd West? I, I am not. My, my family was from the barrette business. The hair. <laughs> No, no, uh, no food or lawyers in my Shapiro some, some background. Good <laughs> we, we have to wrap up, you know. Okay, so we put on this Kickstarter campaign. It was a huge success. It allowed us to raise the initial funding to create an exhibit to showcase the solar technology, which I mentioned. So this is us building the exhibit. That's me on the left in much more casual attire, I'm speaking with Ed Jacobs, who is one of the industrial designers. And we hosted the exhibit in this abandoned warehouse right above the actual site. We blacked out all the windows to simulate an underground environment. In the center, you see the solar canopy, which we constructed and built on site. It was built out to be 30 feet or nine meters in diameter. And it's one version of what the ultimate solar technology could be. So what we were able to do is build something that looks like this. You can see the sunlight coming in through the solar technology. And Beneath it, a small replica of what the park could look like. We have a Japanese maple, a series of mosses and ferns, and mushrooms, which are Isleville, to, to sprout on, on site. Um, you really have to wrap up. You know. OK, so I'll just, I'll, just, um, I'll just close in saying that we've done uh, also a feasibility study to look at what's worked in parks around the world. And, and we think that there's a, a lot in common uh, with the most popular parks. And we're going to build off that in terms of what we would do with the low line. And there's, there's able to create real value is another thing our feasibility study found at both the, the local level and at the city level and uh, helping to build up the business opportunities for the local businesses that make the Lower East Side the, the special place it is. So in closing. Thank you. In closing. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're at a really exciting stage in our development and we are engaging with the city and state officials to gain official control of the site and the good news is that there's, there's a lot of interest and support in creating what would be the world's first underground park as well as preserving an important part of our city's history. So with that, uh, thank you and hopefully... Thank you. <laughs> don't go away, don't go away. Two things. One, personal question. one, I prepared for you a small New York token. And you can tell the people what it is. An apple. A little apple. The second thing, just to mention about you know, special things in cities, this is underground is really interesting. Uh, things. Can you think very quickly about another underground related in a totally different area, New York project, which happened every year in January? New York? In New York? Uh, Do well, you know uh, Agent uh, Todd? I, I don't know Agent Todd. Can you give the, the, the microphone to Greg? Greg, can you tell them what Agent Todd is doing in uh, New York in the underground every January? No. You don't? <laughs> OK, so I will tell you. But I'm not going to demonstrate it this time. Uh, uh, Agent Todd is a very creative guy. He is doing a flash mob uh, project uh, started in New York doing all over the world. About 10 years ago, he discovered there is no law in New York which prohibits people to ride the underwear in under, the underground in underwear. So he's doing an annual underwear ride in New York. This year we had 1,200 people riding it. It's always in the first week of January. We have done it in 50 six cities around I, the I world. did, I did see that. I was very surprised one day. I didn't know what was happening when I was riding the subway. I, I did not take my pants off, though. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, five minutes, sort of five minutes, you know, these were probably the longest five minutes, which uh, uh, is my very good friend, Is Vidra. And uh, Iz will tell you how London is now transforming uh, themselves. And uh, can you tell us in one word before you start the story of your life very quickly? <laughs> <laughs> Hope. <laughs> That's in one word. Uh, born in Argentina, grew up in Israel, 
And then I lived in the States for a few years in New York and San Francisco, and then I moved to London four years ago, married to an American. So I always say like... Uh, Where is the next stage? Mumbai? I don't know, steak, steak with hummus and chips? I don't know what goes well with it. Uh, I don't know. Mushy peas, who knows? Uh, the I was turning to Tel Aviv. This was the question, you know, rephrase. Ask my wife. <laughs> We're having a baby in two months, so let's see. Thank you. Okay, Yves, tell us about what you guys are doing in London. Now I forgot completely what I was going to say. <laughs> Thinking about tell the Tell us whatever you want. All right, so very Long quickly. Long is it short? I promise I'll take uh, five minutes or less. So very quickly, my name is Easy Vidra. I always say easy like Sunday morning, but it's spelled a little different. I think probably Yossi was uh, true to the spelling. And, and I work for Google. I'm the head of this thing called Campus, and I'll tell you a little bit Anybody more about it. Anybody know what is Google? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> little search company. So um, starting with London, because I'm here to represent London, really. London has everything um, a city needs to make startups succeed. We have uh, great talent, we have access to capital, and we have, there's a lot of ideas. There's you know, lots of great uh, schools and universities, and it really it's the, the, there's been some kind of momentum going on in London where we've seen it grow from 200 startups a few years ago to um, probably over 1,000 startups this year. And I'm here to talk more about the code part of creative code, because I'm going to talk more about startups and creative startups. So there's, there's all these great things happening at London, but there's also a few challenges. First of all, I asked Reid Hoffman, when, uh, the founder of LinkedIn, when he came to London, what do you think is missing in London compared to Silicon Valley to make it as successful as a startup hub? And he said, you know, it's very simple. You don't have the density of network. You have all the components. You have angels like Yossi. You have entrepreneurs, you have universities, you have mentors, but it, there's not enough of it, and it's not dense enough. That's one thing. The other thing is it's pretty expensive. Rent is expensive. And it's not the first place you think about when you want to start a technology company. And the other, the other thing is the fragmented community. So there comes campus. And campus is um, usually the way I describe it. If there was an equivalent between real estate and software, campus is an open source building. And what do I mean by that? We, Google, built a platform. We took an old building, seven stories, renovated it, and working with partners and with the startup community, we power the ecosystem. So it's really a platform for startups to grow. Just a little bit in terms, in terms of numbers, the font got screwed up because of the format. Um, we have eight partners. There's over 100 startups that are based uh, at campus. We've, done, we've been around since the end of March, so really just a little bit over six months. We've done over 400 events, uh, 72 in July alone, if you do the math, at several events a day. And there's thousands of registered users and thousands of people have come to campus and visited and worked from there. Now, this is um, a little explanation of who are the, start, the, the partners at campus, but you know, there's essentially a seven-story building filled with startups. So we have anything from um, accelerators and incubator programs to a co-working space that you've heard a little bit talking about, um, basically this need for um, co-working that gives you not only access to relatively cheaper rent without the need to hire an entire office, but also access to a community of peers, etc., that you can work with. And I don't want to go in too much into the detail of this, but you can, you're welcome to look at the website campuslondon.com. So how do we provide density of network at campus? This is, the, um, this is the notice board that we have, the cork board. This is very analog uh, in the cafe. The cafe, by the way, is essentially free, non-dedicated workspace for entrepreneurs. So any entrepreneur or mentor, including all of you, can sign up on the campus website and come and work from the cafe. So you don't need to go and work from Starbucks or from your hotel. You can actually go to a place that's filled with entrepreneurs and get access to mentorship, etc. Every two weeks we empty this thing, and I always, I'm always afraid that it's not going to ever get back full. And you know, 24 hours later, you can't find your own post. So uh, this is the first time I think that there's so many startups based in the same place consistently. Uh, definitely in London, but I think that actually in Europe. So density of network is the first thing that we provide, but we also provide access to mentorship in mentorship programs that we hold uh, every Friday where Googlers come and mentor startups. Uh, we have speaker series. We have a, an educational program, which is essentially an open source, uh, again, working with m uh, multiple partners, helping people uh, that are working on a startup to get the skills that they need when they're not part of an official training program like university or something like that. 
This is just a few examples of startups at campus. This is a company called Just at Zero. They're producing a mobile phone made of bamboo using Android as the operating system. This is a company called Trade Perception that essentially using your social graph lets you know what uh, does a 360 review on you, what your friends think about you, etc. And this is a company called Sayduck that they do augmented reality. When you're buying furniture, you know, if you wanted to buy this table, in, instead of buying it, you could get a little QR code, point your phone at it, and you would see how it looks in your living room. So how does it help and why do startups have work? And I'm going to wrap up with this uh, in a second. There's three things, essentially, that make startups have work. And this is not my idea. This is, I'm quoting Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, which is uh, one of the best accelerator programs. One is the environment. If you're an entrepreneur trying to innovate in a city of butchers, good luck to you. You know, you need to be surrounded by like-minded people where it's cool to be an entrepreneur because they provide support, inspiration, etc. Two is the numbers. You need to have enough of them because you need partners, you need co-founders, you need uh, employees, you need users, you need you know, joint ventures, etc. And the more, the stronger the environment or the stronger the community is, then the higher the numbers, you increase this third element, which is extremely important in startups, and that's chance or serendipity. So I'm happy to say that for the first time in London, you know, with the help of Google, but also working with some amazing partners, we have all three of these in a startup hub that's called Campus. But don't take my word for it. I want you all to feel welcome to come and visit. Uh, coffee is on me, I usually say, but there's lots of people. So if you come and get my card, coffee is on me. Um, and you can just sign up on campuslondon.com. Thank you very much. Don't go away, don't go away. Is, can you say one sentence about the London and the government uh, initiative about uh, Tech City? Because if you are yeah. not going to say it, I'm going to ask Ben sure. to say it. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll say it very quickly. So um, essentially, London has had some momentum in East, in East London in uh, creating a technology cluster and the government recognized it and they branded it as Tech City, uh, which is essentially a series of uh, government and uh, municipal in support in London to help startups grow. So whether it's uh, initiatives to help unlock angel investment, giving tax breaks to angel investors or um, startup visas for employees or startup loans for uh, students to get like feel less, uh, it's less of a risk to start a company. There's a whole a package of, I guess, incentives for people to start technology companies. And you are part of it. Second question, what about Campus Tel Aviv? Campus Tel Aviv, uh, no comment really. Like We're working on multiple things all over the world, but uh, there's no comment, a... but you are planning to do it, right? It will be a floor in Electra building, but yes. this is between the two of us. You know? <laughs> yeah, no one is listening. Um, you know, we, we just launched... So what can't you tell us about... Uh, I can tell you, I can, I can tell you tell that... Uh, tell us what? We just launched uh, Google for Entrepreneurs, which is the, um, the umbrella organization for all the startup support that we do all over the world. And I hope that Tel Aviv uh, will definitely not be skipped because we have an amazing community hope? here. What do you mean? No comment. <laughs> you commit. What are you? Talk to me in the cocktail. Should I talk to him to in the cocktail or should he commit now? And when you come to London, you're all welcome. When we have something to announce for Tel Aviv, we'll announce. Thank you very much, Is. We have another two great presentations. Actually, we should have finished before five minutes ago, but what can we do? Stephanie, Stephanie, you should come and tell me, you know, my English is very lousy. And you have to tell me if you are Knoppel or Knoppel. Knoppel, but KN, you know, they talk English, they say knife and psychiatrist and, and malasot. So you are from Chile, you speak German, and you also know Hebrew. Uh, the story Hebrew of your no, life, very quickly. Uh, so I will speak in uh, English, as usual. Uh, I'm happy that I didn't tell you any secret, Yossi, because otherwise I will be in trouble now. Wait a second. Um, Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, as Yossi was saying, my name is Steffi. Uh, I'm the co-founder of uh, Elastic, which is a, a Tel Aviv-based uh, new company that deals with innovation. And I'm here to talk a little bit about cool hunting and how do we use this kind of tool in order to create new products and innovation, okay? We call it discovering the first seed of innovation. 
So just to start, like when we first started the company, the uh, main statement was we want companies and brands to stop thinking like companies and brands, and we want them to think like startups, okay? Um, basically, what we wanted them to, uh, to do is to fail fast, fail fast and succeed faster. Uh, because we think that everything is about speed. One of the major failures of uh, innovation projects is speed, actually. We were talking, people were talking about it in the panel. This is, our, this is our thoughts. So we created this model that in simple words is like this, of course, that it has a theory uh, behind that. Uh, it's a startup thinking model, and it's based on three principles, human, speed, and test. So at the center of it, we put the speed, okay? Now, how do we trigger that speed in our projects? We start by cool hunting, okay? This is a tool that we, that we use. Now, cool hunting, what is it? It has to do with uh, detecting that creative class of a city, like what uh, Hila Owen was mentioning before. So it's making observations and forecasting about New York existing cultural trends, okay? I know that in this kind of presentations, we always, always, always like to talk about a, a success, but I want to give you a failure example, okay? Many years ago, almost five years ago, uh, we were starting to detect this kind of videos in YouTube, which was, um, and we started to approach uh, uh, sport brands, uh, okay? And we tell them, listen, sport is getting personal because of a new technology, which uh, happens to be a small camera, the smallest in town, uh, that can uh, uh, film in HD, okay? Now, this happened five years ago. What was the answer of all the CEOs? Can they use it? Do they want to invest in that? Yes or no? Of course they said no, because it was only a few users of it. Now, five days ago, uh, this, the third generation of this camera was uh, launched in California, okay? It has more than th 13 million users around the world, almost uh, 200 million uh, views in YouTube, and of course it has been used more than, in more than 60 uh, television uh, programs around the world, including Nat Geo and HBO, okay? So this is the magic of cool hunting. What I mean, if you're able to see it, of course. Um, what I mean is that it puts you in the non-mainstream conscious, okay? Because we believe that over there is a real success and opportunity. So wh what we do, is to try to identify the zeitgeist, okay? The spirit of times. We try to investigate the, all the better products, all the innovators, all the groups that assemble uh, passion because within them is where we find innovation. The rest, in the mainstream countries, uh, it's only popularity. And sometimes many companies are confusing popularity with the business opportunities. But you can late. So while many of the companies are uh, trying to research with a lot of, they are putting a lot of uh, uh, money in researches uh, uh, in the late majority because they found the volume over there, we investigate the innovators, which uh, in, 2000, uh, in the year 2000, it was to only 2.5% of the whole population around the world. And today we can say that it's 7% of the population, okay? Still, it's very few, but this is the people that we like to talk uh, with. So our latest project is a new documentary about the Tel Aviv creative class. We started it here because we believe that this is a great innovation hub as a city. It will follow later on in Barcelona and in Santiago, Chile. Now, what we did is that we gave little cards that some of you already have to say you just got home hunted. And we gave to every people and every element, object in the city, that we thought, even a place, that we thought that it was underground, cool, that it has a spark of innovation, that it hasn't been seen before, okay? Um, and we met them, and we interviewed them, and we tracked them, and we asked them where they live, and how they go. And actually, we were able to map how contagious they are. Um, so this cool hunting project is not about understanding uh, the artist that is the using new military intelligence in order to create his heart, or, or uh, rooftop breeding uh, communities, or a guy that makes music in a bike, or many, many other things. It's also about understanding that probably uh, this kind of guy will be the next big thing. He's a 24 years old, his name is Shai Fogel, he calls himself the fixer, okay? He started three uh, months ago in Tel Aviv, 
um, telling people that uh, he's opened an, a new company called The Fixer, and he fixes your life. He does everything that it's legally, <laughs> that it's legal to fix your life. Who Think needs about everything. fixing his life Think or about everything. Raise your hand. That's it. We're all, the, we're all his market, I'm sure. So um, after three months, he already have 500 clients, okay? He asked for 50 shekels for each, kinda, uh, each time that he, that he uh, uh, gives his service. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm expecting to see many other fixers around the world to uh, being born, okay? But I'm, al I'm also expecting in, the, in one year, municipalities and uh, brands to embrace this kind of service, okay? To have more fixers. Now, this is not just about a cool job. I, I can assure you that I have a lot of fun by doing this, uh, but it's also about data, okay? It's understanding the ecosystem of a, of a city and its creative class. So this is the first glimpse of a map of Tel Aviv, and it shows how trends are traveling in, uh, in Tel Aviv. The yellow shows the innovators, which are concentrated in the south of the city, and uh, when they meet the red ones, which are the accelerators, the trends are going up north. The main issue, and the most amazing thing... You can imagine the cost of real estate, uh, where it's yeah. low and where it's high. The most important thing is that the next big thing is here. And probably the CEOs, the people that are taking decisions and have money, are up there in the north. So cool hunting is the bridge, and this is exactly what we do in Elastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. How long, how long is since you moved to Israel, Steffi? How long you are in Israel? Three years. Three years. That's terrific. Before I invite my next and last speaker, I have to do a few housekeeping uh, <laughs> announcements. First of all, I want to thank on behalf of all of you, the great uh, people of the Tel Aviv Global City, Hila and Abner and Lior and Bacheva and the rest of the, uh, which have which have put this wonderful conference uh, together. Uh, and Susanna, I forgot, usually you mention name, you run into a problem because you forget always somebody. It's really great event. For those of you, especially people from abroad, but also Israelis who came this week to Tel Aviv, I want to thank uh, Ila for this uh, promotion. Now I'm doing what is called the Zionist Shameless Promotion. We have uh, this uh, event in the port of Jaffa, which we are doing in collaboration with the Tel Aviv municipality called DLD Festival. We put a lot of effort and resources in order to offer over 20 free for all uh, uh, events. Most of the events are free for all. You just have to go and register it. Go to the website. Uh, if you are not confused, your IQ is over 165. But, uh, but you can find a lot of events. Some of them are done by these people. Tomorrow there is an event in the library. And there are other events to the test, taste of everybody. Don't miss it. And look at this little booklet because there are also upcoming events in November in the, in the city. So don't, don't uh, miss it. How uh, Mary Antoinette said, how they said it in Latin, Ben, you know Latin. No, no, no. She said uh, bread and entertainment, but she said it. Uh, anybody know how it say, you say it? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, but there is a Latin. In Latin it sounds much better. Not as good as in, not as good as in Yiddish, but... Uh. Okay, our last speaker, Mr. I would say it Ximo, but probably it's Zaimo. Paris, Zaimo, Zaimo or Ximo? How you say your first name? Chimo, not Zaimo, not Ximo. Chimo Paris. Chimo Paris is doing something which is very important. He takes abstract concepts and reduces them into a way that people can visualize and eternalize it. And let's, let me say one word about utopia. People sometimes say about utopia that this is not reality, but uh, I read a uh, in a book from 48 by a guy by the name of Manuel, he said utopia is the tool of the, uh, the realistic leader who is trying to show his concepts in a concrete 
in a concrete manner. And Zymo is doing it with graphics. Zymo, you have exactly five minutes Middle Eastern time, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Um, I'm going to flick through a few uh, stills and then I'm going to show a two minute animation to illustrate what I do. But just as an intro, I would say that um, there was a great presentation before from Robin that uh, it was a great showcase. And it's you are presenting a great idea about uh, this, uh, the concept or, or the development you're going to make in a city. And you get this puzzled look from your audience. And the moment you show the CGI, a computer generated image, people go, ah the pictures and you completely change the mood of, of the audience and that's a bit what happens we're we're like children you know we, we can be tricked by the realistic imagery very easily and half of the times we're telling lies as an example London Olympics um, we were working on the bid for London 2012 and uh, it was it was a lunacy it was it was 2004 to 2007 it was it made no sense what we were doing we were working on the development of the east of london we were developing the lee valley the park this was the image that was used mostly uh, in the uh, in the media to present the development of the olympic park and uh, london won london won the bid against paris paris was ready paris had everything ready the problem is they were a bit arrogant and uh, uh, Paris as a country. Uh, <laughs> not that Londoners are not, but we don't, we try to appear not to be uh, that arrogant. So um, this completely made up development that was impossible to realize that um, was basically a pie in the sky was the way that London did win the, the bid. Um, uh, the funny thing is the energy in London is very challenging and a lot of it has to do with the media and it, it was quite tough for a few years once London won the bid to, to work on it because people were so against it but it still would happen constantly that uh, as soon as we were presenting uh, the CGI, the imagery we were showing, the energy would change constantly. There was, you could, if it was measured in a graph I'm sure you would be able to tell. A lot of what we did was very technical, were presentations, there were uh, releases for the technical campaign. We worked on all different um, sort of presentations showing what the look was going to be, showing the mascots, showing the, the development of the branding from the logo. Some of it was very challenging, the logo for example. But uh, what we did covered all sort of digital asset, assets, uh, also included the ceremonies for the, the opening and, and closing ceremonies and the torch fly through which was quite interesting in a way it was the first time a few months before that we really could sense a change in the wave of the of the the city where we would start to feel a more positive attitude towards what we were doing it was an animation showing the route that the torch was going to do around the uk uh, we also did all the animations for the mascots and sports presentation which comprised of uh, thousands of assets um, it was also used, our graphics were also used as part of the pixel story uh, in the opening and closing ceremonies, uh, which it, it was also quite interesting to develop because of the perspective, the technical challenges. Um, yeah, the, the, for the opening and, so, and closing ceremonies of Olympics and Paralympics, the public was used as the largest screen. So uh, you were seated and there was a pad uh, a digital pad between the seats that you see on the top left and that uh, all together in the distance generated the screen so when you were close each pixel it was hard to tell of course until you were you had enough distance but it was used as part of, uh, of all the graphic presentations and now I'm going to show a, a little animation uh, where you would see um, uh, a compilation of all the all the work we did Rain, 
Chimo, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank I you. must tell you one thing that uh, this really was a very important uh, moment for me because you know about business plans. I always say that the common thing to business plan and a sausage is that only people who don't know how they're being made are willing to eat them. And I think your stuff is much more tasty than a regular business plan. So <laughs> thank you very much. In one word, what other projects have you done other than the London? Quick, quick. Uh, well, uh, we also were part, my team, we worked on the FIFA World Cup submission for Russia and for Qatar, successful bids. We're basically, we worked in quite a few large-scale projects that were... Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to Tel Aviv. One, before we think, I want to share with you, just because you planned the Olympic, my uh, Olympic moment, you know, my London Olympic moment, I was invited by the government as part of a group of what they call Super Angel and we were invited to the closing ceremony and it uh, took me a while to understand what are all these flashing uh, lights in front of me until I look on the other side of the stadium. Nevertheless, something happened to me which never happened to me before, only in London. A well-groomed 50-years-old uh, lady came and sat at the, at the chair next to me and for the first time on, on, um, in my life, she asked me, uh, excuse me, are you alone? <laughs> I was part of the group, you know, so I had to think. So I told her, you know, I hedged my bid. I said, I am part of a group, but yes, I am alone. And I expected to, and you know, my self-esteem went like through the, <laughs> through the roof because I was under the part which is covered by roof, you know. <laughs> And then she looked at me and she told me, do you mind to trade seats with my husband who is sitting? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Before we close, before we close, I want to invite George Thomas from IBM. You've got, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. You were a great audience for this panel. Thank, thank you very much, Yossi, for being with us, and we are on with George. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? Let me just make sure I have all the technology right before I get started. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm really happy and glad to be back in Tel Aviv. Interestingly, this is my uh, second time here this year, uh, and uh, the graciousness of Hila and the team here to organize this is much, much appreciated. Uh, thank you so much. Um, from my perspective, uh, I'm going to cover something uh, that looks at innovation from a slightly different angle. It's a, uh, on uh, 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 Mr. Rooney's panel this morning, there was a discussion with regard to what innovation was, and everybody looks at innovation very, very differently. Uh, at IBM, uh, of whom I'm a part of, um, we are, at the end of the day, geeks, engineers, CPAs at heart. 
We are all about numbers from all aspects of it. So when we looked at innovation, and innovation has been part of our DNA for a long, long time. When we looked at innovation, we tried to quantify what makes it innovative. How do you capture the essence of how do you drive innovation? What it is. And in a nutshell, it came down to one thing. It came down to management and assessment of data. And when you look at data, it's looking at it from two perspectives. It's trying to answer very, very important but difficult questions that we may not have been able to answer in the past. But also, far more importantly, it's also trying to make people ask the right questions. If you grow up in a particular place, a particular industry, a particular segment, you think a certain way. And you're used to asking certain questions to try to get to move your whatever function it is forward, be it a problem, be it something that you want to drive. But you never really are exposed to it. It comes out to the question of, I don't know what I don't know. So a lot of what we were trying to do is try to quantify and measure both answering the difficult questions, which somewhat surprisingly seems a little easier, but we have not been able to do as much, but also really force ourselves to quantify how do I get people to ask questions that they've not asked before, to drive innovation in their societies, in their industries, et cetera. And we came upon a very interesting period in time in the last decade plus, I would say, in that the world is increasingly putting out all kinds of data. Everybody's carrying cell phones, everybody's carrying all kinds of assets that you're putting out. Pretty much everything is instrumented, which is kind of like the first symbol. There's chips everywhere. It's capturing all kinds of data and that's putting it out there. The second this thing is, everything is getting interconnected, both because of the World Wide Web and other means, you can have access to the data. So there's just billions and billions of bits of data that's being generated every day at all times. So we started taking a look at this, looking at it from a specific industry perspective and saying, how can we make sense out of all of this? How do we quantify it? How do we know to get deep industry skills in it? And what can we do to try to fix it? And then we started applying this very, very simple concept, which we call Smarter Planet. A uh, very, very simple concept that we call Smarter Planet across multiple, multiple industries. Um, and of these things, the one thing that I'm going to talk about very quickly today is smarter cities. And the reason we focused on cities is from an urban landscape perspective. It is the place where the vast majority of the people in the world live today. Uh, we crossed that threshold of 50% in 2007, and now there's a vast majority of people that live in a city today. So we looked at a city, applied it across the industries we have, and tried to figure out what could we do to start taking a look at the solutions that exist within it. And from that perspective, and again, this was raised a couple of times today, very interestingly, I thought, is looking at it not just from the functions of what a city does, which is what you see there, but also looking at it from the functions of the ecosystem that cater to the city. Uh, and one of the trifectas, again mentioned today, that we really, really focused in on is the trifecta between public entities, private companies, as well as what we call you know, not-for-profit education institutions, research institutions that cater to the environment to try to figure out how do you foster and how do you do innovation in that lot. And then, within each silo, we got really deep expertise in looking at, like as a transportation problem, what would be the best way to solve questions in transportation. But the true value started emerging when we started looking across the silos and tried to figure out in the ecosystem of an urban landscape, like Metro Tel Aviv, between the government, between the national government, the local government, between the private enterprises, between the innovators, between everybody, how do you foster what you do to get the value that we need? So in a nutshell, we took that concept and started applying it across the three big silos of what we call cities and started doing projects around the world. Um, we have done many, many things of scale from very small to very large, very real results. We have done uh, you know, a few thousand projects uh, of various types across all the silos, be it uh, social programs, educational programs, building efficiency, transportation, smarter policing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, citizen engagement, very, very important in the modern world. I'm going to do two videos very quickly on two projects, <laughs> one on a very small scale that intersects between uh, telecommunications data and city planning in the city of Istanbul. Uh, and I'll let the video speak for itself.
Istanbul, Turkey is one of the world's largest cities and continues to experience a rapid growth in population. The city's population on the Asian side of the city is expected to double to 9 million people by 2025. To help address the massive increase in demand for public transport, the city is investing in new rail infrastructure. IBM is working in partnership with Istanbul Ulasim, the city's transportation authority, and Vodafone to build an understanding of where public transportation is required using the privacy protected data collected from mobile phones. The first of a kind project uses IBM research innovations to map billions of pieces of data collected from millions of mobile phone users each week. This big data delivers rich geospatial information in real time that reveals how people move through the city. Insights are then extracted from the data to show a heat map of the density of people during peak commuter periods. IBM is using this information to scientifically model bus routes that connect to the city's new rail line. Managing the different transport systems, road, rail and buses as one system of systems allows for the optimization of all and improves the user experience. So this is a very small example of using data that exists from telecommunications companies, figuring out what the use of that is and then applying it in completely different spectrums from a planning perspective, from an operations perspective for the city of Istanbul. The second example I'm going to show you is from the city of Rio. This is a much more grander scale. I wanted to do one that was really small and one that is much larger scale. The city of Rio is hosting both the World Cup and the Olympics in successive order in 2014 and 2016. So this is a, it's never happened in another city before. So they had a very unique challenge for a number of years to try to help figure out how to manage that. And this is an example of a project that the city of Rio did to kind of help get geared to it. And this touches on both aspects of data. This touches on how do you manage with what you have, and it touches on helping them predict things that they may not have been able to do before. So this is a, a video from the city of Rio. As our world becomes increasingly complex, rapidly growing cities face unprecedented new challenges. Rio de Janeiro, while known for its rich culture, active lifestyles, and stunning natural beauty, is also burdened with crime, aging infrastructure, and natural disasters. Already a burgeoning city of six million, Rio now prepares for millions more as they get ready to host the 2014 World Cup and the 2016 Olympics. Like other forward-thinking cities, Rio realized it was in need of a new city operations plan to improve emergency response coordination, manage increased traffic, and improve services for citizens. Rio turned to IBM to create a smarter city by integrating more than 30 agencies into one centralized command center. The new Smarter City system gathers data from sectors across city operations, making it easy for security officials and crisis managers to monitor and respond to problems quickly. Data from sensors and video feeds create real-time maps and graphs, working to predict problems and counteract them. Weather monitoring systems forecast heavy rains with state-of-the-art accuracy, giving city officials the ability to anticipate floods and mudslides alert the public and send emergency support. The Smarter City system has improved emergency response time by 30%, making Rio a safer city. The result is a visionary city, equipped to react, predict, and plan for current and future events. But this is just the beginning. Rio's Smarter City transformation is set to expand to transportation, public works, and utilities. Every city, large or small, has its own unique challenges. Working with forward-thinking cities like Rio and more than 2,000 other Smarter Cities projects around the world, IBM is able to help make cities smarter. So that is two very quick examples of things that, uh, that we have been lucky enough to help cities around the world do innovation from an enterprise scale as opposed to like a personal scale you have heard a lot about today. So innovation, you know, let me just conclude by saying this, innovation comes in all shapes and sizes. It can come from a very large concept from a city government or a private enterprise in a city that's helping manage and foster large scale, large scale change, 
or it can come from very small grassroots efforts that can help, uh, help alleviate simple problems and provide very, very innovative solutions. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed to George Thomas from IBM. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's just about afternoon now. Um, I'm Jonathan Howard. I'm going to be moderating the innovation code this afternoon. Uh, I'm the creative director of MC Forum, which is a marketing and creativity training center uh, in Israel. Now, I'll tell you what, I'm very happy actually to see a backgammon board on stage here. I'll tell you why. I trained as an archaeologist, and I found out that the Babylonians invented backgammon about 5,000 years ago, in about 3,000 BC. The reason why they invented it was specifically, and this is true, I'm not making it up, they invented it to teach their kids that you can't control the dice that you throw. The only thing you can, tr can control is your response to the dice that you throw. It was a, a moral lesson, it was moral education for Babylonian children 5,000 years ago. Even back then they understood the the delicate dance between what we can control and what we can't control. And so much of innovation is about trying to control the uncontrollable. Now, the Babylonians created the world's first cities as we know them. They created the template for modern cities, the education system that we follow, most of the systems of, of governance that we follow, the idea of uh, professional specializations that we follow today. It was all created by the Babylonians, and we haven't changed it very much. We've evolved it slightly incrementally. We haven't really changed it much and this is a big problem. Why? Because I found out that the reason why the Babylonians created the world's first cities was crowd control. Everything in the city was set up so that the king could control the people. Cities and religion, very very similar in their, f in their function. Partly it's crowd control and partly it's helping us to manage the experience of being human. But it's about 90% crowd control and very little helping us to manage the experience of being human. These days it's changed. Uh, now the Jews were the first real uh, innovators in cities because the Jews came along and we broke, we absolutely broke the rule in a, about 2000 BC. Cities had already, already been going for a long time and their secret that kept them going was the belief that the king is a god. Everybody believed the king was a god. And the Jews came along and said, he's not a god, he's just some guy. And this was a serious scandal. This is why they started trying to kill us. Now, this was the first act of what Israelis call chutzpah. It was the first act of serious cheekiness. Uh, and we've never stopped being cheeky. We've never stopped having chutzpah. And that's where innovation comes from. It comes from the refusal to recognize limitations. There's destructive chutzpah, which is just about being rude, and there's creative chutzpah, which is about breaking down barriers. And so many Israelis have this creative chutzpah. Uh, Shai Agassi with Better Place. Everybody said, you can't do better than a hybrid car. You can't have a pure electric car. And he said, yes, we can. We'll figure it out. Uh, a, an Israeli paraplegic who couldn't walk, he invented a machine to help him walk again. And that's chutzpah. He totally refused the limitations that fate had placed upon him. And thanks to his chutzpah, thousands of other paraplegics all around the world can now walk again. That's Israeli chutzpah. Um, now, I teach uh, creativity in chutzpah, uh, actually ch teach chutzpah, to companies in Israel uh, and outside of Israel. It's great fun trying to teach Koreans how to have chutzpah, how to be cheeky. Um, what's really interesting, though, is that, that there are algorithms of the thinking that don't rely on social behavior, that don't rely on a cheeky attitude. You can be the most obedient, most hierarchical person in the world, and if you adopt these algorithms of thinking, you will have fantastic ideas. And especially if you share those algorithms with the people on your team, and you're all operating in the same way, you will have fantastic ideas. So this afternoon, we're going to see how some organizations, including cities themselves, are helping the world to cope with this transformation that we're going through, which is that we're now at this stage where cities are flipping. They're switching from being places that are mainly for crowd control to becoming places that are mainly for helping us to enhance and optimize the experience of being human, which means that the impetus for change is coming. The momentum is coming from the people in cities, not from City Hall. That's a very, very uneasy relationship. And this afternoon in the Innovation Code, we're going to have a look at how some organizations, how some cities, and how some very visionary entrepreneurs are helping to bridge the gaps between the public sector, who want to control everything, the private sector, who want to make change, who want the creative progress, who want the disruptiveness. It's a very uneasy relationship, like I said. It can be worked out, and we're going to see this afternoon how to work it out. Now we're going to break for lunch. After lunch, we're going to hear from Raghava, our keynote speaker. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. And then we're going to have the innovation code. So thank you very much indeed so far. And thank you very much indeed to our speakers. Have a great lunch. See you at 2 o'clock. <laughs>